get us started. We're recording. I'm so excited. It looks like I have mostly friends on the line with me, which always makes me feel so much better. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen? I have the yes. right presentation yes. up. Okay, great. Um, welcome, folks. I'm Julie Judkins. I am dialing in from Asheville, North Carolina, lands of Eastern Band of Cherokee. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. I lead our youth programs, our education programs, and our partnerships, um, and what I like to call our equity journey for the organization. Um, and I just really appreciate all of you dialing in and joining our um, our presentation today and we'd love to know who all we have on the line and get start using our chat box so for anyone um, who hasn't used the chat box yet if you scroll to the bottom you'll you'll see it pop up and you can get it open and we'd welcome these prompts from you to, to know who you are, where you're dialing in from today, maybe from an Appalachian Trail community, and what's your connection with the AT? I'm trying to pull up the chat box myself. All right, as most of you know, the Appalachian National Scenic Trail is a unit of our national park system. It provides countless assets and um, resources back to its trailside neighbors. Many of the more than 3 million people that choose to experience the trail each year have very memorable experiences in gateway communities that provide critical services for their safety and their adventures, such as lodging, meals, laundry, shuttles, and most importantly, showers. Um, our Appalachian Trail Community Program was created by ATC building off nearly a century of partnerships between volunteers, partner organizations, land managers to build, protect, maintain, and manage the, the AT. This partnership program really deepens the trail's roots through support to trailside neighbors and building alliances. Now with a network of almost 50 designated trailside trail communities, these important partnerships support advocacy, education, stewardship for the trail and its later greater, greater landscape and its future. Um, we welcome all of you to explore our IT communities. So COVID's been really trying for every human on earth and we've been trying to find ways to amplify businesses within our community network who are finding ways to adapt and pivot. And last August, we held a Zoom call with business leaders and AT communities, and it was awesome. It was so well received and um, we've been asked to do it again. And we're so thrilled to welcome four speakers to talk about their resi the resiliency in their business programs and communities. So what I'm especially excited about is the theme uh, within all of these speakers today. And, Arts and innovation from all of them. So let's start. Let's uh, let's just jump in. I'll introduce um, everyone and read their bio in between each speaker. But we're going to start with Susan. Susan Stowe is a native of Round Hill, Virginia. She's a founding member of the Round Hill Outdoors, which sponsors a range of community activities centered around hiking. Um, nature and conservation. She's the chair of the Round Hill Appalachian Trail Art Show, which we'll talk more about now. Great, thank you. If I could share my screen. All right. Ah. Well, I could see my screen. It. There we go. Um, Round Hill just became an AT community in June of 2019, which was not the best timing given COVID. Um, but as we get ready to celebrate our second anniversary, uh, we're enthusiastic about expanding our programs. I'll tell you about uh, some of the things that we're doing 
But first, I'd like to share how we adapted one specific event to deal with COVID. We held our first uh, AT art show in uh, 2018. And we were just starting to build some real momentum, uh, engaging the schools and the local arts community. And in uh, February of 2020, we held a really great event um, with over 50 artists participating. We had uh, donations from local businesses for the prizes, which were awarded by judges from the school system, which had been really involved um, in the whole process. And we had a catered event uh, with a local winery providing adult beverages. And perhaps best of all, we had a speaker, uh, Rose Turner, who was a through hiker, who had illustrated her hike um, with cartoons. And there was just a lot of enthusiasm, especially from the kids, uh, for the AT, for the outdoors. And that was our goal uh, all along. And we were very excited at the prospect of having an even bigger and better show in 2021. Well, uh, less than a month later, the world changed. So for 2021, um, we faced some major challenges. The school system, which had been so involved uh, in providing judges and in coordinating the student submissions, obviously with distance learning, both the teachers and the students were distracted and it was hard to get the same kind of focus. And the Round Hill Arts Center, which was our co-sponsor and our venue, um, was limited to 10 people at a time and masking. And also we were reluctant to ask local businesses for um, prizes uh, because they were already dealing with a lot. So what we did uh, was uh, be more active on social media in trying to spread the word and generate interest. We were doing weekly promotions on a lot of uh, artist group Facebook pages, community Facebook pages. Uh, we did not bother the businesses for prizes, but uh, our sort of sister organization, the Round Hill AT Festival, uh, gave some really fun prizes for both adults and kids. And we ended up doing uh, sort of a hybrid show that gave people a lot of different options on how to see it. Uh, the Round Hill Arts Center does allow up to 10 people at a time with masks. So we still had the in-person show, but we also had a complete replica show. Um, oh, <laughs> um, in the hung in the windows of the town office. And it's really fun when I'm next to it, uh, watering the native plant garden to see all the people who stop and are looking at the art. And we also have the complete show online on our Round Hill Outdoors website. Uh, so if people want to look at one particular work and we have a video, which I'm going to show you now um, while I talk about the other things that we're working on. So uh, Round Hill Outdoors, uh, was originally founded in 2017 to encourage our neighbors to get outside away from their screens more and uh, support the AT and uh, also Nature Conservancy. So we do a number of things. Uh, we do community hikes, uh, which we started on our own, but now we're doing in conjunction with the new Blue Ridge, Ridge chapter, of the PATC. Uh, we've had a lot of events, um, well, several events uh, with speakers from Leave No Trace and the uh, Virginia Master Naturalists. And uh, we do a screen-free week every year. We're not sure how we're going to do that this year since people are going to be on their screens a lot. Um, but we're, we're working on it. That will be at the end of April. Uh, in addition to the AT art show, which you're seeing now, uh, we did one um, last summer that focused on native 
plants and animals. It was our native species art show. And we had quite a few wonderful kids entries in that because they were not in school at the time. Um, but our biggest effort is the uh, Round Hill Appalachian Trail art show, which uh, started in June of 2019 uh, and it was actually to celebrate our becoming an AT community member. We had over a thousand people, which amazed us. Uh, with music, we had talks on hiking and wildlife conservation. Uh, there were hands-on demonstrations of camping, first aid, leave no trace. Um, we had uh, nonprofits with booths. And for the kids, we had a lot of activities with hiking and nature themes and scavenger hunts and bingos and trivia. And everyone was really excited. And we scheduled our second show for June of 2020, which of course got pushed back, our festival pushed back to September of 2020 to June of 2021. But now it's looking as if um, we're definitely gonna be having it, fingers crossed, uh, September 11th and 12th. We've got almost all of the the speakers re-engaged for the new dates. And um, it's gonna be a two day event on Saturday. We'll be having music and speakers. And we're really lucky that our venue, uh, B Chord Brewing has a large outdoor professional stage and a hillside sort of amphitheater with lots of room for social distancing. And we'll have booths uh, scattered around for nonprofits and also vendors uh, with sort of a focus on, you know, hist traditional crafts and that sort of thing. And um, then on Sunday, we're gonna have uh, AT related hands-on training. Uh, there'll be demonstrations of hiking and camping, a through hiker panel, hikers yoga, um, a one I'm really looking forward to called Beyond Ramen about uh, trail cooking, as well as sort of a non-continuous bluegrass jam. So we'll adapt um, as we've been adapting for the last year. Uh, and we're really excited to be holding the festival, assuming we can do it safely. And that's it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Susan. All right. What, we have time for... Um, one or two questions, if folks want to pop it in the chat, you're welcome. If you wanna come off of mute, you're welcome to do it that way too. Um, would you be willing to send out your lineup of activities and speakers for Absolutely. Your this year, Susan? Absolutely. Uh, we, there's a website that has all of the information that we're continually updating as we uh, get more uh, people confirmed, but I think it's going to be exciting. That's great. I mean, I feel like we need to change venues and um, we've, we've had uh, our annual trail events in the past. They've been successful, but we had to put everything on hold last year and this year it'll be you know, probably smaller, but in the future, what you guys are putting together is impressive. We're so lucky to have a venue that has the big outdoor stage, which was a decision they made. They built it during COVID so that they could continue to have really top notch local bands come. So, so awesome. absolutely. Thank you so much. We'll have time for more questions at the end for all of the, the panel speakers as well. But now I'd like to introduce Jan. And we talked before and I, I learned that it's Jan Bowden if you say Appalachian and it's Jan Bowden if you say Appalachian. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so, um, Jan has been a self-employed artist for 28 years, specializing in metal sculptures and fused glass. Jan has lived in Northern Michigan, Pittsburgh, Portland, uh, Minneapolis, and Amish country in Ohio, and now in Eastern Tennessee, where she opened up Union Street Gallery in Irwin with her husband in 2018. 
loves the mountains and doesn't plan on leaving. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Um, my name is Jan. We live in Irwin, Tennessee. Irwin is 30 days out from the start of the Appalachia Trail. And the whole town really counts on knowing when a, a large group of hikers leave Georgia so we can kind of anticipate when these hikers come. Um, our gallery, although it's not really uh, a destination for hikers, we do get through hikers in. Um, and with COVID, we had to shut down our business for about four to six weeks. And that did impact us. I used to, um, prior to COVID, I taught plasma cutting, welding, and fused glass. Um, I've had to eliminate those classes. Although we had to shut our doors, we were still working in the studio, which is behind the gallery. Um, and as a result of COVID, our income went down 30%. So we took a big hit. Um, and prior to COVID, our town, the first week of May, held what was called the Outdoors Festival. And it was kind of in conjunction with a large group of hikers coming in at that time. A lot of hands-on um, activities for kids and families. There was a tank set up for fishing. There was a, a kayaking tank. There were um, stations for archery. And for hikers, there was a um, pancake breakfast really early in the morning. Then one of the stores, which is an outdoor store, which caters to hikers, set up um, foot stations for massages and foot baths. And this year, we last year, we did not have the outdoor festival. We were thinking um, that we could restart the festival, but it's really strange. Nobody wants to uh, commit as a vendor, especially if you're a hands-on vendor. We got a lot of vendors who wanted to sell outdoor type things, but that's not what the festival is really geared toward. It's geared towards activities and catering to the hikers that are coming through. And nobody wants to touch somebody's foot if COVID's still around. I mean, so it's, it's canceled and it's a shame. But, um, we have seen some improvement with business more activity, but uh, so far, the things that we have done in the community geared toward hiking, it hasn't reopened yet because everyone is so afraid and that's kind of sad, but that's about it. Thank you for sharing your story, Jan. Um, does anyone have a question for Jan? Um, yes, I'm not quite clear. Are you still going ahead with the festival? Just not the hand no. on? No, not, they canceled it. They yes. said the response was they don't want it to be half ASS. They would, if you can't have the uh, activities because really that was the fun thing, mm -hmm. all the, the activities that were available. And through hikers did participate. I mean, it, it was a cool event. Mm -hmm. And so now all we have are vendors wanting to sell their wares. Well, that's not real exciting. That's not what the outdoor festival was geared toward. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for sharing your challenges and experiences. All right, up next. We've got Susan, a second Susan. Susan Shearhart is a lifelong hiker, camper, and self-described nature nerd. She currently serves as chair of the Front Royal Warren County Appalachian Trail Community Committee designated back in 2012. She supports her nature habits by working as a paralegal for a New Jersey legal services company, and she satisfied satisfies her need for outdoor engagement by serving as a Boy Scout leader. 
a guide for the Trail Tribe, Trail Tribe, a local hiking and backpacking group for women. Recently started her own guiding com company, The Next Bend Adventures. And in addition, she's part of a group of the local outdoor industry professionals developing a destination management organization, Shenandoah Outdoors, to promote the area as an outdoor destination recreation area. Her favorite pastime is with her three young adult sons. They played a role in how she earned the name Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Thanks, Susan. Oh, and I'm sharing my screen for you. Oops. Thank you, Julie. And while um, you queue up the slideshow for me, I'll just start chatting with everyone. This past year certainly has been a challenge for all of us. And I'm enjoying learning of all the creative ways our communities have adapted to meet the ongoing and increasing need for outdoor experiences. Because if COVID has taught us anything is that the outdoors is essential. Um, due to COVID and the inability to have in-person events, um, our community um, has done several things to continue engaging with local folks to meet the need for outdoor adventures and to continue promoting the Appalachian Trail. First, we've taken advantage of technology and we've partnered with two local public libraries offering virtual programming with um, Samuels Public Library right here in town. We've um, presented programs focused on basic hiking essentials and leave no trace principles. And then with Hanley Regional Library, which is located in Winchester, just north of us, we've established a new monthly series called Third Thursdays Exploring the Outdoors. I am your host. Um, so each month I interview an outdoor enthusiast or an outdoor activity provider about an outdoor activity. What is it? How do you get involved? Where do you go to engage in this activity? Um, what are the essential items you need to participate in that activity? Safety concerns. Um, and we always ask about a conservation issue and the latest, most popular question, how do we deal with poop PM periods in the outdoors? And um, it's, it, it was very interesting how that evolved, but that has become a standard question now. <laughs> but that is something that people have not always been in the outdoors or wondering about. So it's important to provide that education. Um, a program that has also become really important um, is something that we started during our designation process as an AT community. And I'm referring to the Quest Shenandoah program. This past October, the AT Community Committee was invited to participate in a downtown celebration of the outdoors called Back to Nature. It was designed to promote the town's reopening efforts to the public tagged Back to Business, Back to Nature. And we were asked to provide guided hikes that would complement some other outdoor activities like free kayak rides, um, a gallery of art provided by artists who were inspired by nature, uh, musical guests and things like that. Of course, under the ATC's guidelines, we could not hold in-person events or provide these guided hikes, but we did have something in our back pocket that we could offer. And it was these quests, which are self-guided hikes um, that share and explore and celebrate our local spaces. So um, Julie, if you wanna advance to the next screen, what, we'll talk a little bit about what is a quest um, and we used this downtown event to actually relaunch this questing program. So a quest is a place-based edu education program. And it's similar to geocaching or letterboxing if you are familiar with those. It's a treasure hunt to celebrate community, natural history, cultural sites, stories, and special places. And you do that by creating a, a series of clues utilizing poetic prose that brings a quester to the starting point and then each clue brings the quester to another point where they might learn uh, an interesting piece of information about that site, a story, or some feature. And then the final clue brings you to the end point. And at the end point would be a treasure box containing a number of items, including a ledger book, a unique stamp, and some other treasure, maybe a bookmark or some little trinket that the quester could take with them as a memento of completing the quest. Um, typically, a quester would also have a passport, a little book, 
um, that they could use to track their questing activities. And they would do that by using the stamp found in the treasure box that they could stamp in their passport. And that was evidence that they completed the quest. And maybe the quester had their own unique stamp and they could actually use that to stamp the ledger that was in the box. Or they could write a message using a pen or something like that. And we would encourage questers to create their own stamps or purchase their own. In fact, prior to COVID, when we had events in town, we would staff a tent and maybe partner with a local organization where we would have materials available for people to create their own stamps. And our local Girl Scout troop was very um, successful in getting people to sit down and create these stamps and get engaged in our questing program. In fact, they wrote one of the quests um, that is part of our program. Um, if once the questers completed um, a certain number of quests, they could earn a special patch. Um, and if you completed all the available quests, we have a special limited edition patch that could be earned. Now with COVID, um, the challenge was that we couldn't guarantee any safety with these treasure boxes at the end of the quests. So we had to change how the quests were written and what was the treasure at the end. So what we decided to do is give each quest a color code and the final clue, clue of the quest was designed for the quester to identify the color code to record as proof of completing the quest instead of presenting an imprint of the stamp that was in the box. And then we gave them another option too. They could get creative and maybe take a photo of themselves or a mascot or something in the final location that the final clue identified. And then once they completed at least three of the quests, um, they were eligible for a patch and they could present themselves over to the staff at Mountain Trails, our outfitter on Main Street, and the staff there would, you know, engage with them, look at their proofs, and then present them with their patch. Um, at this point, I'm going to show you um, a copy of what a quest, our most popular quest, looks like. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can see it. Oh. And now we can't. Is it there now? No, it, it was, was there for a second. Okay, here we go. Let's try it again. It went away. There, there you, go. you go. Got it now? Yes. Awesome. Okay, this is our, our most popular quest. It was designed by our local tree steward community. And it takes the quester from our visitor center located in downtown Front Royal, just a few blocks down to our arboretum, which is um, developed and maintained by the tree stewards. And as you can see, there's a series of clues and there's even little spots where as you identify or decipher the clue, you can put the answer in. And then um, once you complete that quest, the final clue actually used to take you back to the visitor center where the treasure box would be located. So it's designed to, you know, they're going through downtown, they're going through our arboretum and it brings them back to the visitor center. They get their proof, but they also can engage in other ways um, with our downtown community. Um, in this case, um, this particular quest to comply with COVID at the final clue, which is number nine, which is actually near a bridge that crosses Happy Creek, um, the clue was for them to look at a particular object to see what the color of that object was. Um, and then that would be their proof. And then other quests have been written by our historical society, by members of our community. Um, we've also have an architectural quest, which was developed by a number of, of local residents very interested in architecture. And we did hold um, a competition um, that we received several um, um, entries for um, by a variety of groups, including families that take people not just downtown, but out to the Appalachian Trail and also to a local state park. And so Julie, if you wanna continue sharing your screen and then I'll just show you an example of what the, um, you can advance to the next one. And that just shows you, it's just the box, the treasure box is just a simple plastic box with a, a lid and there's the ledger and the stamp you can kind of see. This particular box, we had bookmarks that had the leave no trace principles on printed on it that um, questers could take with them. And this particular quest was written by um, the prior chair of our community committee, Sonia Carlberg, who's also a thru hiker. So she wrote a little bit about her thru hiking experience 
and this particular site of this quest, which is Possum's Rest, which is along the Appalachian Trail near us in Chester Gap. If you advance again, Julie, I will, you will see an example of the patches that you could earn once you complete at least three quests. So one was designed to celebrate the Question and Doa program, and the other one just celebrates our community committee. If you advance again, um, these are the locations where you can find Quest Shenandoah. In the social media world, it just it lives on um, the town's website, discoverfrontroyal.com under questing, and also on Facebook on our community's Facebook page. Now we were inspired by another community uh, up in New Hampshire, Vermont. It's called Vital Communities. And I think there's one more slide, Julie, that has that website. Um, if people were interested in creating a questing program in your own community, um, you could look at our program, but this website actually has some great tips and tools that you can use to create quests nearby, um, you know, how to link quests, um, a lot of great ideas on uh, topics or ways to use your, your, your town's particular story, whether it's historical, cultural, natural, and how to incorporate them into quests and how to share them and promote them within your, your community. And I would love if more of our Appalachian Trail communities would start creating quest programs because maybe we could create some super quests and, and connect all of us along the Appalachian Trail. Oh man, I would love that too. <laughs> <laughs> you could have a whole AT questing book. That would be amazing. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks, Drew, for sharing all these great links afterward. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Susan? Everyone's absorbing, absorbing all that great information. Um, I would definitely be interested in uh, promoting, organizing a quest up here. Um, awesome. A few years ago, we were going to have a geocaching mm -hmm. activity on the trail and that was not allowed. Right. But um, something like this quest, uh, just getting outdoors. There are a lot of places where you can get outdoors up here, trails and, and uh, other activities in the area. So we could easily do that. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that the response to both our initial launch of this program and then our relaunch has been very positive. We've had a lot of activity and engagement. We've handed out quite a few patches to people. And I think in times of COVID, particularly families, they're looking for activities like this. And a lot of our quests are designed for families. They're easy to get to, but they're not so long that a young family couldn't complete. But we've also designed some of them that the end point of the quest is not a traditional end point of that particular trail. So if that group wanted to continue exploring further along the trail, they could do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. If Thank folks you. think of other questions, we'll have, we'll have time after our last speaker who I'm excited to introduce now, Bowie Barnett Zunino, is a founder and co-executive director of the um, Wasaic. Oh, did I say it right? Okay, good. <laughs> the Wasaic Project. She holds an MFA in sculpture from the Rhode Island School of Design and a BA from William College in Studio Art and Psychology. She and her husband live in Wasaic, New York with their two daughters and two large dogs and when not working she enjoys hiking, running, and eating turkey. Yummy. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us Bowie. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I apologize my hair is still wet from running a part of the AT this morning with my dogs. Um, so and um, yeah so I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Um, here we go. Um, one second and all right, that seemed good. Um, so yeah, it's been a very strange year. Um, 
as everyone knows, for the world. And we are a community arts organization located in um, Wasaic, New York, which is touches um, Kent, Connecticut, which is an AT community, um, as well as we are in the Harlem Valley, which is also an AT community, I believe, and Stancy can kind of correct me if I'm I'm just learning in being a part of this, how these designations work. So if no one's official, I apologize. But in my upbringing, I have spent a lot of time on the AT from growing up in this region and I'm so grateful for it and um, love it so much. Uh, my organization is an arts and education um, organization, but really is about engaging communities and families and artists and um, enlivening our community, which I think is so much the theme of this. Um, this is a screen from our annual report and is really just about all the sort of things that shifted and we did this year. And um, as this is sort of a conversation about businesses and what we've done in these challenging times, um, I thought I would just go through some of the solutions, some of the things we were already set up with and were already happening and some have really changed. Um, one thing that happened, uh, as with everyone was that we were stuck at home all of a sudden and we were spending so much more time on our computer screens and you know, feeling disconnected. So one of the first things we did in early COVID was that we um, started a thing called Quarantine Bingo. And we're known for a lot of our playful activities and family friendly events. And so we, uh, an artist pair that we know who used to own a bar offered to run Quarantine Bingo for us from Turner's Falls, Massachusetts. And one of the benefits of COVID is that we can be all over and be together, you know, similar to this conversation. Um, so we hosted a whole series of uh, quarantine bingo and people were attending and we were sending prizes through the mail. Um, we also started really doubling down on our public artworks. We always have artworks throughout our buildings um, and times where people can come through, but as that could not safely happen, um, we really started to think a lot about curating work throughout our town. And something that also happened at the same time was that our rail trail, which has been seven years in the making and extending to a larger um, Harlem Valley rail trail connection, they just needed a quarter mile connection that brought it right into our town and they finished it just in the spring of last year. So that was a very exciting moment. And all of a sudden this influx of people on their bikes and people were coming into town and parking because we're the start of a rail trail that goes all the way um, up through, um, these are Canadian towns that mean nothing to you, but it goes now 20 miles north and is, has, I think they plan to connect it all the way to Canada. So that's very exciting. So the rail trail in this picture goes right to um, the right of our building and that's the stop of the rail trail. Oh. So there are a number of artists that we started to really, instead of works that were supposed to be installed within the building, we just, we pivoted and you know, being artists, that's sort of the most fun thing to do is that you get to pivot and you get to um, creatively problem solve. So that's been really the nature of this last year. Um, this is a piece called um, Campfire and this artist um, buried a winch in a motor underground. And so over the course of a year, this whole campsite sort of came together into this giant sort of mess of a ball and it's coming down tomorrow which to the you know joy of our neighbors we're just like now you just have a giant trash pile there <laughs> um but it's a pretty it's a it was an awesome piece and the videos of it happening we have it's sped up on our website it's really really wonderful um we hosted a series of video projections um on the side of our building this was a piece by christy chan and it was a waterfall that was projected backwards so every saturday friday and saturday evening this happened and people would come out and see it um we did special events so throughout the winter getting people outside we host a lot a lot a lot of virtual presentations open studios um we provide we made a book so usually our exhibitions in that big silver grain elevator. This year we said, people are gonna wanna hold things. We need, we're all in front of screens so much. We need to make something physical. That is an experience for people. So everything was online and we had the book made that you could go through it online, sort of samples of pages, but we also physically produced it and we sent it out and people purchased it. And it was laid out with this sort of real physical experience of going through the building if you knew it well, but in reality, 
it was it sort of lives digitally it never was made as a show and the top floor is usually our big 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 show 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 stopping thing and this year our top floor was about portraits of our community and sort of stories thanking them for what they did in our history of of the organization that's been around for 14 years and then we also did a checklist of things you can do in your small town to um to make work with your community um we did featured artist talks happy hours in the studios we our education program we launched a series of virtual lessons um they're all free and on our website and they're you know can be for all ages so this artist, Maximilian Boda, did dream drawings. He made a coloring book that you could download. Um, Mariana Paragallo did um, anthropomorphic sculptures. These are all videos on YouTube and then also has step-by-step -step and we're making a workbook. Um, we did mixed media portraits. We did a profile self portrait workshop, which was really great, especially in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and these could, you know, really could be internationally nationally used so if anyone knows anyone who would want to use these lessons they're on the Wasay project website um usually we do a haunted house this year we did a haunted parade um so we put all the arts projects on floats and brought them through town oh and we i meant to bring this up earlier as we were talking about the rail trail but we also um a bike shop has opened up one of our board members bought a community barn and is running a bike shop out of it um, this restaurant is The Lantern that my husband and I used to be managers of and now are just the owner representatives of, which is great. Um, and this was the inside. Obviously, we closed the interior of the building. Um, this is our head chef, Johnny Durth, and he's making takeout. So we did a lot of takeout. We also started providing food for a local food bank every Friday for immigrant communities, especially ones who weren't um, able to take advantage of the subsidies from the government. So we were doing a lot of 50 prepared meals every Friday, but we did a lot of outdoor dining. That's our side yard, which already existed. Um, we started doing community auctions to help local businesses and restaurant workers who were really being hit hard early on. Um, we did a Bakers Against Racism event early on. Um, and then we built a newsstand and the newsstand was all about COVID, getting people outside and safely able to gather. So um, our manager and our beverage director has done, Erica De Silva has done a beautiful job of curating um, these sort of art and food. And um, this is a record store that we did a record pop-up. One of my, our best friends and, co and board members of the Wasaic Project is an avid record, record collector. Um, so yeah, pop-ups. This was an Italian grocery. We're doing something on May 1st. I'm sure I'm running out of time. We did, so then we, this winter realized that pop, we were able to gather safely. So we did drive-in bingo instead of quarantine bingo. So here are all the cars and we projected on the building and you could honk when you won and flash your lights and we'd run out with prizes. Um, we've made more publications an umbrella, just trying to really get creative about things that we could make that people could physically touch. So as people were reading bingo, we were running out and giving them umbrellas. Um, this is the book we're making right now for our exhibition. So things that we learned from COVID that we loved, even though we're gonna safely have an exhibition inside, the book was so special to have it in people's homes that we're making another one. This is called The Secret of the Friendly Woods. Um, there's all these activities within it. Um, and then I just want to say I was so impressed with the Shenandoah quest. I'm always thinking about quests. A few years ago, I made this Wasaic Explorers Club bat badge and I never did any. I mean, we gave them out and put them on our kids' backpacks and stuff, but I still have a huge stack and I feel really inspired uh, by Susan's presentation. And so I'm going to I'm going to make a quest and uh, and make that be the prize. So I think that's the end. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation amazing it's amazing how many things that you ha did in one year <laughs> like wow um so innovative so exciting and um yeah i'm blown away by everyone's contributions um and all that you've done in your communities does anyone have questions for bowie or for any of our panelists at this time we've got a few minutes just to have some conversation and dialogue together. 
I'm happy to jump in here because I am a huge fan of the Wasaic Project. <clears throat> they are the uh, number one attractor to the Harlem Valley. They put us on the map as a destination and uh, they've supported every trail day we've put on with uh, some of their artists and residences <clears throat> coming down and uh, tabling with tabling, mostly bringing the kids in. And uh, when we had our last trail day, which would have been 2019, they had a table where they were making buttons with the kids and the kids could bring anything to the table to make buttons out of and it was jammed and the kids were bringing in tiny little pieces of ferns and little piece of little pieces of grass and tiny flowers and and cutting out parts of logos um the bears on the npca uh logo and um and putting them on and people would say where did you get that and then be well over at the wood with the, the Wasaic project table and just generated a lot of excitement because it was a hands-on activity um, having to do with the outdoors and art. And um, Wasaic project was uh, one of our partners in the Harlem Valley Outdoor Recreation Economic Assessment project that we did. It was an Appalachian Trail Conservancy pilot and uh, it broadened the, um, the focus from just the Appalachian Trail to the whole Harlem Valley, with the idea being that people would, the international name recognition of the Appalachian Trail would bring people into the Harlem Valley. Uh, where we've got some of the poorest towns in Dutchess County and we can use the extra tourism revenue as Dutchess Tourism knows well. And um, so balancing the economic benefits with uh, conservation in rural communities, the Wasaic Project is a perfect ex example of that, building up the economy in the town of Wasaic, um, getting buy-in organically from the community, supporting the community. Um, the Lantern Restaurant, Wasaic Project brings people in, introduces them to the Harlem Valley Rail Trail and vice versa. So they're at the terminus of Metro North, the Harlem Valley line. So it's accessible by public transport. And unlike other um, destinations, you can take the train right to the Wasaic project. Um, other places you'd have to walk or get um, additional transportation. You don't need that here. So, um, I mean, I could, I could go on and on. I got some vinyl at the record store. <laughs> <laughs> mostly, uh, mostly for the covers. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the Wasaic Project has been supportive of everything we do and, and uh, their campus, if you will, which is quite extensive, um, is part of the conservation efforts in the, in the Harlem Valley. And any conservation effort um, extends to conservation efforts everywhere. We wouldn't be a destination for outdoor recreation without the forested uplands that we have, the river that we have, and these guys promote that. So like I'm the perfect people. model of art, the intersection of art and community and conservation and trails. So you guys, Thank that's also sharing. nice of you. We're also collaborating with Cary Institute, which is a really prestigious science center in Millbrook, New York. And we're gonna be making um, education modules about observation and um, ecology. So we're working on that right now. And this spring we're piloting the elementary, but we're gonna have elementary ed, middle school and high school modules, hopefully by next year. And they'll be online and all free and they'll be ready to go lessons. Um, so if that appeals to anyone, you know, maybe subscribe to our mailing list or something because those are coming and um, they're going to be, they're going to be great. Fantastic. Could be a good adventure topic. Yes, Drew, I was thinking the same thing. We have, um, we're also about to launch this year's um, series of 
what we call our adventure sessions. Um, and they are one hour Zoom sessions that um, are hosted by an educator and a partner, community partner and an expert of, a, of um, this, theme, this year's themes are um, focused on natural and cultural histories. And um, our, our, our April one is gonna be celebrating National Poetry Month. So um, that'll, that'll be launched on our website, hopefully by the end of the day. <laughs> um, any other questions for our speakers today? Well, I am certainly excited to um, say thank you. <laughs> and um, I have so much gratitude for all of you spending your time um, during the busy week with us today to share about your, your businesses and your programs and for all of you um, and the contributions that you give to the trail and your communities. So thank you so much for joining us and I hope you all have a fabulous evening.